I am here with CEO Colonel Douglas McGregor again today. Colonel, how are you? Great. Super. So I want to start with this, and we'll get into the the Israel conflict a little bit later, but I want to start with this. A recently published poll by Eurasia Group Foundation found that 58% of Americans think that the U.S. should push for a negotiated end to the war in Ukraine, citing the high humanitarian cross, cost. Excuse me. Meanwhile, 34% want the defense budget to decrease. 16% would like to see more than half, would cut the deficit with more than half. Colonel, what does this mean exactly? Because what it tells me is that People don't want to be involved in wars abroad and potentially now two wars abroad if we include Israel. Oh, listen, that's uh, spot on. We should pay attention to that poll because that reveals a great deal. <clears throat> I'm sure that if you were to sit some of those Americans down, they would raise the question of why are we spending all of this money overseas and doing nothing for the United States? Where is the benefit to the United States of investing so heavily in this war in Ukraine? There is none. There's no strategic benefit to us at all. And I think Americans sense that, and, and they look at the border, they look at the crisis that we have there in the Southwest, and generally the crises in the cities, and they all reach the same conclusion. And when we talk about Israel, we should consider carefully these comments about Ukraine, because historically, Americans have not wanted to be involved in overseas wars. And frankly, the lesson of the Iraq debacle was clear. If you can't fight something that's short, sharp, and decisive, that takes months or years, forget it. Don't do it. It's a losing proposition unless it's a vital interest. And it's not a vital interest in our case to be involved in wars in any of these places. Let's talk a little bit about that war in Israel now. Uh, some major events happened this week. There was a, a, a bombing that happened. The president is currently there. Anthony Blinken has been there. We have a lot of American leaders going there. W where are we and, and what do you think happens next, Colonel? We know that apparently Anthony Blinken is now a sitting member of the Israeli cabinet and uh, National Defense Council. He's sitting in on all of these meetings. Uh, that's unusual, to say the least. There are a lot of people who are saying we're now in charge of everything that happens in Israel. But the truth of the matter is I'm wondering whether or not the Israeli leadership is not in charge of everything that we bring into the arena. They undoubtedly have priorities and they have interests. I don't see any evidence that we're pushing back against any of those. I don't see any evidence that President Biden is suddenly going to announce that after discussing the situation and the terrible casualties that have been taken in Gaza as a result of the bombing, as well as the losses the Israelis have taken, that now is a time for a ceasefire, for negotiation, for re-examining exactly what's happening. I don't see anybody looking for any off ramps, uh, Mike. I just don't. And then here at home, we have the voting for the, the allocation of funds for Ukraine. And uh, the Republicans have said, uh, not all of them, but many of them have said, look, we're not going to vote for this uh, until you suspend spending in Ukraine if you want to move on to Israel. In other words, we, we can't do both at once. Contrary to what Mrs. Yellen said uh, recently, the Treasury Secretary, uh, I said, Mrs., I don't know if she's married or not, but she said, oh, sure, we can afford two wars, absolutely, without question. I don't know anybody in the financial world who really believes that. When you have a $33 trillion debt, sovereign debt, over a trillion dollars a year in deficit spending. Remember, $4.5 trillion uh, is effectively fixed. That's Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. These are the so-called, what is it, entitlement programs. Uh, nobody's talking about cutting those. I, I think it's just ridiculous. I think, no, we absolutely cannot afford to do both. And we ought to look very carefully at what we are doing in Israel right now. I don't think Americans have any idea what's happening there. I, I almost disagree with you a little bit. I don't know that we can afford one, let alone both, right? That's the other side of it. We're spending money there right now. And I don't know that we have that to spend. As you said, we have major issues in America between the border, between our cities and crime. There's some money that probably needs to be spent here. Let me ask you this. Two carrier battleships going into that region. We have 2,000 troops that now that are on notice, Colonel, that they said you may be going over there. How do we contain this? What is the strategy? You're a former military member yourself and a colonel. How do we maintain this of who's going there, what's going there, and what they're actually going to be doing there? If you go back to 1990 and 91, before we actually committed ourselves to serious action, we managed to contain that conflict in the sense that we limited it to Iraq and the U.S.-led alliance against Iraq. We were able to keep Iran out. We were able to reassure the Saudis that this would not destabilize and destroy their society. All of the other players in the region were effectively on the sidelines. 
I think that we accomplished that again in uh, 2003. Once again, we turned to everyone and said, this is about Iraq and uh, removing the regime there and ultimately finding the weapons of mass destruction, all this sort of business. And everybody shook their head and said, okay, we don't like it. We prefer that you didn't go. Some of your viewers may remember that the Turks at the time refused to allow us passage through Turkey to get into northern Iraq. They said no. And so we had to steam all the way around uh, through the Red Sea and up into the Persian Gulf to deliver another 30,000, 40,000 troops and equipment. So I, I think uh, this has failed. Anthony Blinken is too little too late. He was effectively rudely treated in some cases. In some cases, I think he was treated with contempt. And in most cases, he was lectured by the people he sought to discuss things with about their unwillingness to underwrite this destruction of Gaza and the expulsion of its population. And I think that's where we are right now. I think the entire region is sick of us. <clears throat> They're sick of Americans telling them how to live how to govern themselves. They don't really want a war, but I think they're being pushed to the point where they said, we might as well resolve this, even if it costs us dearly to bring this state called Israel and its mentor in the United States under control. I think that's a very dangerous set of circumstances. What is the American interest there? Are they aligned with Israel and uh, Yahoo? Are, are they are these interests aligning? And to your point before, Colonel, does America support this? Does the everyday taxpaying American support this war and support potential, like you've said, two wars in two different continents? Do, do we support that? Well, first of all, Americans have not paid much attention to what happens in Washington because most of the time, most Americans aren't interested in what happens beyond their borders. They say, where's my check? Where are my food stamps? Uh, how, how can I afford what's in the supermarket? If I can't, then I've got a problem. If I can afford to buy it, then I will. Years ago, there was a situation when Newt Gingrich tried to stop dead in its tracks the government and, and government spending uh, under Bill Clinton's leadership. And ultimately, he lost the fight because the average American was unhappy when he didn't get what he wanted, and the president won the battle. But in most cases, people would answer when you say, what do you think about the shutdown? And people would say, that doesn't really affect me, so I don't care. Others said, yes, it does affect me. I think that's the problem. Right now, the wars overseas that we have been fighting have not exacted a very high price in American life. We've lost thousands of people killed. That's true. We've had thousands more wounded. But it's almost unnoticeable to the average American. For instance, during World War I, we fought for 110 days, and in 110 days, we had 318,000 casualties, including 110,000 dead. That's one of the reasons that Wilson, when he left office, turned government over to the Republican Party for the next 10 years, because people were furious with the Democrats for having brought us into the First World War. We're not there yet, but we're getting closer to it. And if we were to lose anything substantial as a result of our intervention, on behalf of uh, Israel, I think the American people would react very negatively. Now, you said, do our interests align? Some of them do. We have always had an interest in preserving the existence of the Israeli state. But in the past, when we thought the Israelis went too far, presidents have intervened. Nixon intervened in 73. Carter intervened later on. Reagan intervened and said, enough's enough. But we've also been very careful not to commit troops ashore. And this is what worries me. We have a thousand soldiers in Syria, probably have almost that many in Iraq. Now they're talking about several thousand in Jordan and potentially these 2000 special ops. What does this mean when they go ashore? What it means is that they're vulnerable, that they can become targets. As soon as Americans show up in any real strength, everybody wants to kill them. Why? Because if they can kill them, they figure they can break down the consensus at home and we'll leave. They're not wrong. We lost 38,000 in Korea, 58,000 dead in Vietnam, over 100,000 wounded. Eventually it catches up. So they're not wrong on that. But the problem is when you put troops ashore, you end up as you did in Lebanon back in 1982. Some of your viewers may remember when Reagan finally acceded to the wishes of Secretary of State George Shultz and said, yeah, I'll put a battalion of Marines ashore, reinforced to about 1,000 Marines. And then we'll have Marines in this hospital stationed nearby. We have to have a hospital ashore to deal with casualties. You remember what happened? A bombing. Over 380 people are killed. And immediately, Reagan called uh, Weinberger, who was the Secretary of Defense, and he looked at him and he said, you said don't send our troops in there. You were right. I was wrong. I listened to George Schultz. I shouldn't have. He said, so get them out now. 
he cut his losses and got out. And since then, we've been pretty careful about not pushing too many troops into the way of people that we know want to kill them. We're casting that aside and we're going ashore. So we'll see what happens. But two battle groups offshore aren't going to change much ashore. I think the idea was we can reinforce the Israeli Air Force and bomb Hamas, or not Hamas, but uh, Hezbollah. The problem there is we don't know what everybody else who's part of this catastrophe is willing to do. So that's where I was going to go next. So this is what is difficult for me to understand. Obviously, we have a conflict right now between Israel and Hamas. There's other actors there that were willing to get involved, maybe Iran, maybe Turkey, other places. We all want peace, obviously, but we're on the precipice of a big problem, in my opinion. What happens? How do we fix that? How do we make sure we don't get to that point where Iran's getting involved? Maybe Russia's getting involved. There's all these different actors. How do we make sure we don't get there, Colonel? I think we should consider running you for president or at least secretary of state because you're asking the right questions. And I'm unconvinced that these questions are being asked. Uh, And I'm also afraid of some bad assumptions. The Iranians right now seem to think that it's inevitable that we will attack them. They seem to be engaged in preparing themselves for it. The Turks are looking at what's happening. And I think Mr. Erdogan has decided it's pretty clear that the Israelis are going to go into Gaza. And so he's quietly told Turkish forces to get ready. He's also got Turkish naval forces not that far from ours in the Mediterranean. They are going to be joined by Russian naval forces. I think the Russians have planned to send a hospital ship. The idea being that they could anchor offshore from uh, Gaza and open up a humanitarian uh, corridor across the beach. Uh, These things all suggest that other than Israel, we have no support in the Middle East for whatever we want to do. No one is interested in what we want to do or what we are proposing. What they want to do is stop the invasion of Gaza. The Israelis haven't gone in yet. And I attribute some of that to their concerns about the state of training for the IDF, especially with hundreds of thousands of reservists who aren't very well trained and haven't had much time to prepare. That may be part of it. I don't know what else is on their minds. But if they go into Gaza, then I think all bets are off. And that's why, personally, I was hoping that Biden would go there and then come out and announce that we found a different way forward. We're not going to introduce thousands of Israeli troops into Gaza. But we haven't heard that. And so I have to plan for the worst. And I think that's the attitude for everybody else in the region. The worst thing that can happen is they go into Gaza and kill more Arabs, not necessarily Hamas. Some will be Hamas, but large numbers of Arabs who just happen to be there. Uh, that's unacceptable. And that will bring the rest of the region down on Israel. Before we move on to our last topic, today, let me just ask this question. Has America lost respect across the globe? Is America not the same as maybe it was 20, 30 years ago? And when you know America got involved, things sometimes got handled, Colonel. Right now, it seems like America gets involved and, and it, craziness ensues. It, it, have we lost respect across the globe? Yes, uh, it's more than respect. I don't think people trust us. And we are widely viewed now as as an enemy. Whereas if you go back 30 years ago, go back to 1990, it was a very different attitude. People respected us even when they didn't agree with us and they tended to trust that we would keep our word. You'll remember that in 1991, after this conflict ended, we withdrew our forces, which we said we would do. And we tried from that point forward, at least until 1994, not to meddle anymore in the region. It's our meddling repeatedly over and over again to install a new government that will do whatever we tell them to do, frankly, that has gotten us into trouble. So I think right now nobody believes us. And you got to understand they're looking at what's happened in Ukraine. We've spent, what, somewhere around 80 billion at this point. I I don't know. I've listened to different uh, calculations, but virtually everything we've sent over there has been destroyed by the Russians. And this great Ukrainian army that we exalted as the answer to our needs has been utterly and completely destroyed. The Ukrainian state is destroyed. The place is falling apart. So if you're sitting in the Middle East and that, many people are saying, listen, I don't think the Americans really know what they're doing. And they don't seem to have done very well. So again, to go back to your original point, I I don't think they they really do respect this anymore. Saudi Arabia is very important to us and has been for decades. And then MBS, Mohammed bin Salman, the crown prince, met Blinken. But before he met him, he made Blinken sit for 24 hours. He simply wouldn't speak to him. And when Blinken showed up, it was largely a one-way conversation. And that was also true, I think, in Egypt. Uh, I think Sisi, for him, it was a one-way conversation. 
again, we're seen as a danger because we could actually destabilize everything. They really don't want to do that. But if we're insistent on pressing ahead, then I think the attitude is we might as well go in there and try to finish this problem off, which I think is a catastrophe for Israel and for us. And President Biden had other meetings scheduled this week that have been canceled. So to that point, it's yeah, the, we're, king we're, Jordan, the king yeah. of Jordan, who's always been a yeah. good friend to us, won't even speak to us because yeah. he knows that his country is at high risk of falling apart. He's got more Palestinians in his country than he does Jordanians. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a problem. And, and hopefully leadership is what I think we need. And, and we'll get there in a minute. But let, let's talk about the border here for a second. So we're talking about things overseas right now. But here at home, we have a massive issue and a wide open southern border. And people argue this point back and forth, Colonel. The video is there. The footage is there. You can see this stuff. And it's not fake news reporting. It's actual live streams of our border. People walking over there's numbers, Colonel, that are saying up to $10 million during the Joe Biden term of president, or 10 million, excuse me, 10 million individuals that will walk across that border to enter our country. Well, how do we fix this? What do we do here? Because this is a massive issue here at home that is going to, it costs lives with drugs. It costs lives with crime. We need to address it. We need to address it now. That's right. Uh, we, we think that at least over the last five years, roughly 100,000 American citizens have died every year as a result of fentanyl poisoning or yep. overdosing. That's not everybody who died from drug use, but that's just fentanyl. And of course, we know it's coming up from Mexico. The fentanyl is packaged and shipped up to us right through our borders. Some of it comes in through the sea lanes, up from, especially in the Caribbean, and to some extent in the Pacific. The bottom line is I think Americans are looking at this and they're beginning to say, what do we believe? Because the numbers provided by the US government are really very shallow very small. I talked to some people at Homeland Security on condition of anonymity, and I said, I'm being told there are about 5 million that have come across, five and a half million, some people say six, they started laughing. I said, what's so funny? He said, it's at least seven and a half to eight million right now that we know of. These are the people that we identify when they come in, we register them theoretically, for what reason I haven't figured out. And then we let them in. We let them go wherever they want. And they get a free ticket to anywhere they want to go in the United States. And of course, now this is starting to share the pain because people in Chicago and Philadelphia and New York and other big cities that are accepting these people have no place to put them. So now they're asking the federal government to allocate hundreds of millions of dollars, even billions to, to build housing for all these people. They're building a, a veritable city down in Texas right now. The, the sad part is that this is not just a federal question. This is also a matter for governors across the United States. Governors have enormous power in their constitutions. And if the governors want to call out the National Guard, for them, the, for the National Guard, these governors are the commanders in chief and order them to go to the border and shut things down, they can do that. Now, if the federal government doesn't like it, it has a choice. It can take them to court or it can try to send in federal troops to force the National Guard to back down. I don't think that's a, a very appetizing event from the standpoint of Washington. But I think it illustrates the frustration that people feel. Why is nothing being done? These people are coming in. We can't assimilate them. We can't employ them. Our, our economy is weaker than perhaps it's been in decades. We're looking at a guaranteed deep recession as a minimum. Why are we doing these things? And I think we all know the answer. This is to dilute the uh, the basic core population of Americans and to create a potentially a new base for the left that they think will keep them in perpetual power. All of this is, is just ridiculous from the standpoint of the average American who says, how do we survive this? How do I put food on the table? What about my family? All of these people are absorbing enormous resources. You know, we have about 27 million Americans that don't have uh, health insurance. If you're talking about anywhere from 25 to 35 million, we don't know. Uh, illegals out there, where do they go for health care? They go to the emergency room and we provide it. I mean, we don't turn people away. Who's paying for it? The taxpayer is paying for it. And somebody said, well, that we're borrowing from the Chinese to sustain these wars. No, that's misleading. We're actually borrowing from the pension funds. Yep. Yes, Americans who expect to have a return on their investment in retirement. The, the whole thing is a financial catastrophe without question. How are we going to solve it? There's only one way to solve it. It's to cut it off, cut your losses and get out. That's what any rational president would do. And any rational president, like the ones that I mentioned before, would, would go in with Netanyahu and say, look, we support you. We stand with you, but we will not underwrite 
the wholesale destruction of Gaza and the expulsion of its population. That's contrary to our values, who we are as Americans. You can't expect that. So we won't do that. If you insist on that, you're on your own. As soon as you say that, the Israelis are going to say, all right, time out. <laughs> and I, that's I, where we need to go. I only laugh when you say we're not borrowing. Do it At the end of the day, we're spending money that we don't have, right? So it's coming from somewhere, whether you borrow it, whether it's from the pensions, whether you tax people, it, 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 the money has to come from somewhere because we don't have it. So that's concerning to me. And our last question on this uh, with the border, we have people sleeping in airports. We have people sleeping in four and five star hotels in New York City and other places. But when you see these people coming over, Colonel, they told us it was the women and children, right? People coming to the country for a better life. They need to. They have to. They told us. It's not. It's a bunch of middle aged and, and young men walking across, filming themselves on a camera. Hey, look what I'm doing today. And some of these are, are from serious national security interests. Like, we don't know where they're coming from. Some are coming from places like Iran and Gaza, places like this. Like, that to me is the most concerning of it all, Colonel. We don't know who these people are. And that puts people like you and me, our listeners, everyone in this country, at serious risk. It's interesting that recently someone on the Hill brought up the possibility that. Do you think we could have terrorist attacks here inside the United States? Could we have violence inside our country as a result of all of these people coming into the country from the Middle East, Africa, and not just South America and Central America by any means? Of course, the answer is yes. We don't really know who's here. So I, I think that's probably inevitable. It reminds me in 2015 of what I saw when I was in Germany. Remember that at this point, all the Europeans were being told they were racists and bigots if they did not admit millions of people from the Middle East into their societies. Yep. I watched a clip on German television that was almost immediately removed. You can't find it anywhere anymore. And describing exactly what you just said, a gaggle of young men. Their pockets were full of euros that they'd picked up from the Emirates or Turkey or somewhere. And they too were saying, oh, why are you coming? Oh, we, we heard the women here are beautiful. So we're, we think we can come in here and do whatever we want, including rape. And of course, that was taken off German television. But guess what's happened since then? In Germany, Scandinavia, we know what's happened. It's a huge crime wave. Maybe we're not noticing the potential crime wave or the terrorist wave because we've got so much criminality as it is in the United States and our big cities. But I think it's reasonable to assume that all these young men are not coming for jobs with Morgan Stanley. They're not coming in here to go to Harvard. They're coming in for probably the wrong reasons. The question is, how long do we put up with this? And what are we going to do with them when we finally decide to enforce the law? We think they should be expelled. But that'll be a fight because people are always finding excuses to do nothing. Doing nothing seems to be the favorite thing inside this country on many occasions. I think Americans are finally pushed to the edge, but they're still not there yet. So, Colonel, let, let's finish with this. I, I know OCOC has received tens of thousands of emails from people. How can we get involved? How can we help? And I think sometimes looking at it, it's frustrating, right? There's issue after issue. It's not just the border. It's not just crime. It's not foreign wars. It, it, there's a million things that are going on right now. We don't have a, a Speaker of the House in our country right now. There's a lot of things going on, and Americans are fed up and irritated, but they don't know where to start. How can they get involved? I think that right now, this moment, the most critical thing that can be done is essentially what happened in 2014 with uh, Barack Obama. Some of you will remember that he planned to announce a strike package of, of bombers and, and fighters that would go into Syria uh, because the same people who are now pushing the war in the Middle East and pushed us in Ukraine and pushed us in Iraq were pushing him to go to war in Syria. When the word got out, and I'm not sure how it happened, hundreds of thousands, millions of Americans called the Hill. They called their congressmen or they sent messages into their congressmen and senators and said, we don't want this war in Syria. And they said so. They made it abundantly clear. And by the time he was ready to announce the, the strike package, everyone came to him in the White House and said, don't do this. This is a disaster. You'll be destroyed. Right now, today, every organization in the United States that is concerned about the future of this country, every American who is concerned about the future of this country needs to send the message we want a negotiated settlement in Israel. We don't want another war. We want a negotiated outcome. That's what they have to do. That's number one. Now, secondly, I think everybody should join our country, our choice, because we're going to be fighting for years now on a whole range of fronts on some of the issues that we just discussed, specifically ending these overseas interventions, 
going after criminals, restoring the rule of law, dealing with the border and immigration, stopping the sexualization of our children. We're going to do those things. But today, right now, get on the phone, write a note, send an email, whatever you can do, send it to the Hill and say, look, we want a negotiated settlement in the Middle East. We don't want a war. Believe me, this will have an impact. And the congressmen love the big donor money that they get. There's no question about it. Big donors are trying to buy this war. And they're circulating a document right now that trying to recruit people for a declaration of war against Iran. That's insane. We have no interest in going to war with Iran now or ever. And so the bottom line is, get on there, send this message. We want a negotiated peace. If you do that, it'll make a difference.